packed all my worldly goods in a cardboard suitcase. I went to Hollywood. I had done a little story research on different fairy tales I might do, and Snow White was one of them. I thought it was a perfect story. Aren't you proud of it, Mr. Disney? Well, I'm so proud, I think I'll bust. <laughs> I felt that there should be something built, some kind of a an amusement enterprise built where the, the parents and the children could uh, have fun together. We know what our goals are. We know what we hope to accomplish. And believe me, it's the most exciting and challenging assignment we've ever tackled at Walt Disney Productions. W, -W Radio, your information station. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 439. I'm here to help you have the best possible Disney vacation experience and bring you a little bit of Disney magic wherever you are with this podcast, videos, blog, live broadcasts, special events, books, audio tours, and more. You can find everything over at www.radio.com. So the connection between Walt Disney and New Orleans, Louisiana goes far beyond New Orleans Square and Disneyland and the Port Orleans resorts in Walt Disney World. In fact, the influence of the real New Orleans can be found throughout the parks and resorts as well as in the music, parades, films, and in other ways you might not have known of before. And having just returned from the real French Quarter, we're going to also discuss just how close the parks come to the real thing. I'll then have the answer to our last Walt Disney World trivia question of the week and pose a new challenge for your chance to win a Disney prize package. Then stay tuned to the end of the show for more information about upcoming events, meets, and more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. Having just returned from my first trip to New Orleans for our on the road event, really since the since I was a kid back for the World's Fair in 1984, I really find myself often thinking back fondly on a city I very, very quickly fell in love with, and not just because of the beignets, the gumbo, po'boys, crawfish, pralines, shrimp, cracklins, jambalaya, sazeracs, etc., 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 the history, the stories, the architecture, the, the people, the music, and the energy make it a place I can see myself revisiting over and over again. And while I was there, um, I found myself chatting briefly in between meals with friends about the connections, plural, between Walt and the parks and the real New Orleans. And I instantly knew what this week's show was going to be about. Because if you think that New Orleans Square and Disneyland and Port Orleans are the extent of the many intersections and interactions Disney had with New Orleans... I want you to keep on listening. And joining me this week is a man who not just loves the Disney parks, but their history, their creator, and a great, big, beautiful bowl of spicy seafood combo. He is Ryan Wilson from the Main Street Gazette. There are snacks on this show, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, warning and disclaimer between, for listen, I should just put this at the intro of every show I do. Don't listen hungry. Um, it'll no. be a mistake if you do. That's how, that's how we're going to speed this along, though, is we're going to want food by, by minute five. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how long it takes. I'm going to do my best to not keep... Well, I, I did it in the intro, so I, I blew it already. Yeah, that's um, where I got hungry. That's where I got hungry. Yeah, so a couple of questions for you first, man. Have, have you ever been to real New Orleans before? Just in passing. I mean, it was, it was kind of like a fly-by-night thing. I saw it, and I was gone before. It was, so really, the answer is no. My friend, uh, you and I need to go on a like like a buddy movie. We need to go to New Orleans together because it is a. Uh, I'm, I'm I kid you not when I said that I fell in love with the city and its people very very quickly. And you know when like I said at, at sort of the introduction, 
when you think or you hear Disney and New Orleans, I think instantly you think about Disneyland or Port Orleans. But there are so many more. I mean, as we start to sort of go down this rabbit hole of research, I, I was fascinated by how many connections there are. And I and I love the fact that it starts much earlier. And it really the story really begins as well it should with Walt Disney himself, because Walt's interest in New Orleans goes back not to Disneyland or maybe even you're thinking some of the films, but it really goes back to his childhood, right? He always we know of his love of railroads, but he also loved the steamboats that went, you know, from like St. Louis all the way down to New Orleans. And when he was in France uh, during the war, when he was an ambulance driver back in 1919, he had met a friend there named Russell Mass, um, who we had met while he was the ambulance driver. And he had talked about wanting to take a trip, you know, saving money with Russell. He had a few hundred dollars in the back and taking a trip down the Missy, down the Mississippi, the entire Mississippi, all the way down to New Orleans. Yeah, and it was going to be on this, you know, the. I've heard it called a raft. I've heard it called a boat. Whatever the ship was that that Mass had had basically built himself, this was what they were going to use for this excursion down down the Mississippi River, which truly was that you know that almost that piece of Walt going back to those steamboat days, to those to that era where he fell in love with Mark Twain's Mississippi, and and this was going to be their their journey down that. And like many of Walt's other unrealized dreams what, that he wasn't able to fill, fulfill in, in childhood or in real life, he builds his own. He builds his own version, right? He ends up building his own full-size stern wheel paddle boat on his version of the Mississippi River, brings Tom Sawyer into it and the characters of, of Huck Finn and sort of that lazy fishing on the docks in Disneyland. But we are obviously getting uh, ahead of ourselves. But it, it, like I said, man, I, I love the fact that it does go back to Walt and a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in terms of the connection and the relationship and the return to New Orleans for Walt is not just a a business-minded one or a story-driven one. It is a a personal one for him as well. It definitely is. And you can see these pieces, whether it's his love of the Mississippi or the technology he finds there or the stories he finds the the music he finds it, it all comes back to these pieces that that really grabbed his interest and he knew what the impact of these were and how to, to turn them into something really grand that could capture everyone's imagination and even if you go back you know early on to some of uh, the Mickey Mouse cartoons and the shorts and the TV shows you know look the first Mickey Mouse cartoon takes place on a steamboat, right? And the, the right. song talks about the steamboat, you know, racing to New Orleans. Go back to the early 60s and the, and the wonderful world of color. There's a, uh, you know, Walt sort of in, invites you to watch what's called the Von Drake Report, where he is reporting on two festivals that are going on. One is Carnival in Rio, and the other is Mardi Gras in yeah, New Orleans. It, it, yeah, and, and, and you, you even see it long before, even when you get to Disneyland and you're looking at the park, there are, you know, postcards about New Orleans long before there was a New Orleans square and the barbecue and the food of, of the area that, you know, it just, it, it was something that was definitely, you know, whether he recognized it or not, it was deep seated uh, passion of his that, that he found ways to, to bring out and explore for everyone. And again, it's, it's a personal thing for Walt, right? We yeah. know about his love of travel, uh, not just domestically, but internationally. He loved cruising. And one of the places that he loved to visit was actually New Orleans. And we, I'm sure we've all heard the story about, uh, you know, the, the genesis, the origin of the audio animatronic. And as the story and legend goes is there he is uh, with his wife, shopping in some of the many, still in existence, antique shops in New Orleans, and he finds this antique mechanical bird in a a gold cage and became fascinated because this tiny little bird was able to move and animate and sing and tweet, not in the 2016 version of tweeting, but the original version of tweeting and was fascinated about what it was inside this bird. What What were the mechanics inside this bird that could make it sing? And could he take it and, dare I say, even do it better? So he buys the bird for his wife, and I'm using air quotes, and ends up taking it home and brings it to his imaginaries and says, take this bird, reverse engineer it, and see if you could make it better. I want this bird to sing and move on cue. I, I want this to be what will eventually become sort of the first audio animatronic bird. 
It's kind of like Walt went to Disney or to New Orleans, and all I got was this dumb bird. <laughs> uh, but it was it was this it was this old toy, this old French toy that came from the 1850s, and he said, you know, and it was if they had had this a hundred years ago, why, you know, why haven't we built upon it now? What can we make from it going forward? And he took that one bird and created an entire room full of singing birds. Yeah, and it's amazing. And I think I, I've spoken about this in the past. I believe back in 2009 or so when D23 had their first opportunity for guests to go and visit the Walt Disney Archives, I was one of the first groups to go in there. And Dave Smith, who I had known from interviewing on the show in the past, fortunately was there that day. And he took out the bird. Like he brought out the bird and I was fascinated because there it was. It was this this piece of Disney history and the legacy and everything that came with it. And there he is just sort of carrying it in his hands. I'm like, dude, like put on some gloves, man. You got like Cheeto dust all over your hands. I mean, he didn't have Cheeto dust on his hands, but um, and the bird, you know, he said, look, if we wound the bird up, it would still work. You know, they were they took it apart, but they were able to put it back together. And it was fascinating because the bird itself is maybe four inches tall if that you would think it's sort of a, a giant bird like you see in the tiki room but you're right man that's the genesis of of, of what would become you know the, the the tiki room birds abraham lincoln you know stitch and all the other you know advanced animatronics that we see today and that came directly from something you found in new orleans yeah and, and the fact that it, they could still wind it up and it would still actually sing is just a, a testament to the meticulous nature of the detail you know it wasn't just let's take it apart and figure out how it works it's Let's figure out how it works so that, and put it back together so that we know we've done it correctly. And, it, and you're right. And it leads to the things where we have you know, the Yeti today. We have Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion. You know, all these things came from this tiny little four-inch bird. And I love the fact that the bird is still there. And I will tell you, man, when I was in New Orleans uh, and walking around and I visited a lot of the antique shops, uh, you know, my favorite thing to do – other than eat, uh, was to just wander uh, in and out of the alleyways and the streets. And I said, man, if there was one of these antique shops that got smart, maybe a little crafty, got smart and says, we are the shop where Walt Disney bought the right. bird. Nobody would know the difference, right? There's no receipts. Right. I, was, no- <laughs> I was wondering, I think you went bird hunting, didn't you? you oh, absolutely. Bird. I'm like, how is nobody at least trying to leverage that story and tie it into their shop? So um, it would be fascinating to find out, you know, where it was that he bought it. But, you know, certainly we would never know. But, I mean, look, that that interest that he had in New Orleans, like you said before, it far uh, predated what would eventually become New Orleans Swear. You know, he wanted something to be New Orleans themed in Disneyland from before day one, right? I mean, look, even going back, you know, almost a decade before, as they're getting ready for things like Song of the South, he goes back and visits New Orleans again, right? He wants to get the feel and the flavor of the South. He sends Harper Goff back to New Orleans to watch Mardi Gras before Disneyland because he knows at some point they are going to have some version of New Orleans inside that park, whether it's a street, a land, a shop, a restaurant, or a combination of all the above. And it, and it was always there. Even when the original plans were for a small park across the street from the studio, there were these plans for a paddle wheel steamer you know, that was going to be out there, that was going to tie that New Orleans piece to it. You know, then there was talks about it, you know, right off from from the Jungle Cruise, you were going to have Magnolia Square and it was going to be the New Orleans piece. And there was always some plan and development that was going to tie New Orleans back into that park. Yeah, you're right. I mean, one of the original locations was where Magnolia Park was around the corner from Jungle Cruise mm-hmm. was going to eventually develop into a New Orleans themed area. And the idea of the, the, you know, the balconies and, and you know, the, the exterior of what was the Aunt Jemima Pancake House and the Plantation yeah. House. You know, so many of the things that they were already starting to put together were going to start to tie into it. Then as the late 50s come and they're, they're coming up with this ideas of whatever this haunted house or the wax museum is going to be, they start to, again, bring this idea into what is now going to become New Orleans Square. Yeah, and, and and that you know that really starts looking back at in the '60s, even by even by '61 at this point, they're talking about this haunted house and this you know museum tour that you're going to be able to go on. They have handbills that they're handing out at the gate in '61, and and it's going to be you know the late '60s before we actually see it come to fruition. But it is that long genesis of okay, we know where we're going. Now it's all the steps in between to get us there, and they were 
you know, absolutely convinced they could do it and they had to do it right. Well, and he had people like Sam McKinn working on concept art for it. But as the 64, 65 World's Fair comes on, he's got to yeah. pull a lot of people off what, you know, we'll call sort of the New Orleans project so that they could work on the fair itself. Uh, but even before New Orleans Square came, you know, Frontierland actually had a New Orleans street and it had the music like the silver banjo barbecue and things like that. So although he couldn't expand to this full blown land, he was already starting to bring it in in little sections. Definitely. Even at park opening, you have you have the people talking about the spirit of New Orleans with the music and with the Firehouse Five Plus Two that are playing. And, you know, it was it was going to be that feel. It was going to be there. And so it was and whether or not it was its own land or was this extension of Frontierland and Adventureland, that spirit tended to live right in that park until they could get back and do it correctly. And and they did. And it was the first yeah. New land that was added to Disneyland since the park opened in '55, and the the mayor of New Orleans at at the time actually attended the grand opening, and he joked that it actually cost more to build New Orleans Square than it was for the Louisiana Purchase. Right, and Louisiana Purchase was like eleven million dollars, and New Orleans Square cost about eighteen million dollars to build because it's you know a a three acre or so area really well themed to the French Quarter, and they've got the steamboat replica, and eventually you're going to have where Pirates of the Caribbean is going to be and the the home of the Haunted Mansion. And people in New Orleans and the mayor and so many people felt so, you know, honored to to have a, a single city represented and, and, and honored by Disney, a, a city, a, a, a land that took, you know, more than four years to create. Yeah, and it was, and it was, you know, they, the fact that the mayor came to to there, and you could see if you go back and watch the video, you could see Walt, you know, how giddy he was at the idea of opening this land. You know, he talks about when they talk about the Louisiana Purchase, he's like, well, the dollar has gone up since then, and there's there's a moment <laughs> where the uh, the mayor makes him an honorary citizen. He goes, you know, it's just like being in New Orleans, and you could see Walt mumbling only cleaner because he was not going to have any anything dirty happening in you know there was going to be no dirt in Disneyland. Uh, you know, but he just couldn't contain his enthusiasm for the fact that he had finally built his version of New Orleans right there where everyone could come see it. And, you know, true to Walt and the storytelling and, and the attention to detail was so incredible. And I think that's why people were so impressed because it wasn't just in what you saw. I mean, it was in what you ate. You know, they talked about how they had celebrated and having like shrimp remoulade and gumbo and croissants and a flaming dessert and all these things. But there was a story about how early on you could hear uh, like a voodoo queen um, yep. chanting off, you know, sort of like in between where the bathrooms and the train station is, wondering if that was Marie Laveau, who was a, a voodoo practitioner in the 1700s and 1800s. There's actually a picture of her in uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean. And actually, if you go to, and this is the one thing I want to go back and do, is do the, um, the, the, the graveyards, believe it or not, in New Orleans are beautiful. Like the mausoleums are, are spectacular. I mean, they're like homes and the uh, the St. Louis number one graveyard, you know, one of the inhabitants is Marie Laveau, who was that voodoo queen. Uh, it's also Nicolas Cage has <laughs> something there, too. But <laughs> I'm more curious about Marie Laveau. But so many of those things, uh, you know, the spirit of New Orleans, the, the feel of New Orleans. Um, and again, I think even the, the, the shops and the dining was Yes, for Walt to tell a story and bring this land in, but I almost want to feel that it was because of his personal love of the the, the city as well and the quarter. I think so, and I think you know you, you look back, back at some of the early plans before we had Blue Bayou, which was the restaurant. You know, there was going to be a Blue Bayou market where you walked in, and it wasn't the sit down dining experience that you were ha- going to have. It was going to be a shops. It was going to be a bunch of shops you could walk through, and a thieves market, and you were going to be under the stars, and uh, supposedly in the basement was going to be the pirate museum. And you know, he wanted you to get that tangible, real world feel that you get from truly walking through and touching and 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 seeing the tangible, real you know pieces that are from the world that we all live in and you know he just translated them straight over to to Disneyland to give everyone over there that that feel of what it was like to live to you know, to live and walk through that era of New Orleans. Well, and and to that point man, it, to get that feel, to get that experience, it has to be multisensory. It's not yep. just in what you see, it, it's what you hear and you alluded to it earlier, so much of the music 
that you hear in New Orleans Square. Look, there was even New Orleans music and jazz music in Disneyland before New Orleans Square. They had Dixieland at Disneyland back in the early 60s. Um, Louis Armstrong uh, performed on the Mark Twain steamboat. Obviously, Armstrong, who was born in New Orleans, sort of... um, and it, there was actually an album that I recorded called D- Disney Songs the Satchmo Way that sort of brought that New Orleans feel to some of the Disney standards. Uh, yep. Louis Prima was also born in New Orleans. He was in, from in the Jungle Book. Um, but there was a lot more, you know, live music that you would be able to find not just on the streets of Frontierland, but throughout Disneyland. Um, there was the, uh, the the Johnny St. Cyr. There was the uh, the orchestra that he had there with the young men from New Orleans, mm-hmm. Disneyland After Dark, the Royal Street Bachelors. I mean, it goes on and on and on. There's a lot of live musical talent, which I think Disneyland does very, very well, um, that started performing early in the 60s, and, and it even continues today. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't go there and not think about the band marching out into New Orleans Square. You can't th- – th- it's just – it doesn't happen without it. You know, you have the Bayou Brass, you have the you know side seat strutters, with they're complete with the horn sections and all these different instruments. It, it just it was it was always going to be there. Whether and you're right, it didn't matter if it was in New Orleans or if it was going to be on television or if it was on Main Street or if it was in Frontierland. That that jazz, that real infusion of music that you get from New Orleans was always going to be there, and it was always there in some other way. Whether it was like you know like you talked about. Louis Primo with the with the Jungle Book and they, and they brought it back and today that's still there today and we're still hearing that song, you know whether it's in the parks or in the new movie being whistled, it's all there. Yeah, and I mean still to this day in New Orleans Square, you know I believe currently it's the, the Jambalaya Jazz Band or the Royal Street Bachelors. I, I believe at least I know last time I was there, Princess Tiana did sort of like a Mardi Gras thing where she would come out and and sing songs from Princess and the Frog, but. The way that Disney, uh, gosh, I, I, I want to almost, and maybe I can now justify a trip out to Disneyland to talk about how they have done such a good job recreating the French Quarter um, with the courtyards and the, the balconies and the music and the food. I mean, look, we could talk, and we should talk separately, all about the food because from the French Market to the Blue Bayou to the Mint Julep Bar and the Cafe Orleans, I, I mean, you really get a sense. And now that I've been to New Orleans, I have to go back and compare the food um, from real New Orleans to New Orleans Square. Yeah, and, and it is incredible of how you, know, you think, especially a lot of these restaurants that are quick service restaurants, that they're just gonna, you're getting you know, the generic version of it and you're not. They, they've taken great care to, because New Orleans is so known for you know, truly its music and its food to recreate both of these pieces inside that park. That there's not, you know, it would be interesting to see: is there a misstep, or is it fact? Is it in fact as as authentic as we think it could be? I mean, look, even the shops, and and I will tell you, and I'm not just saying this because I'm sort of in a New Orleans kind of mood. But the last time I was in Disneyland, and even the first time I went there, the very first place that I ate was in New Orleans Square. My friends hadn't arrived yet. I was wandering by myself, and I had a bread bowl full of soup, and I loved wandering the streets um, or the alleyways and, and the, they are winding alleyways, you know, of New Orleans Square. Um, and I was and, and I loved how unique the, the shopping locations are there, right? From the, the, the crystal shop to Port Royal and, and pieces of eight and and it has such a different feel it looked like New Orleans, right? There's a souvenir shop right. everywhere, but it has such a different feel than I think anywhere else in that park does. I think part of what it is, and, and at least for me, thinking back, you know, I was just there last February. It, it is, it's the streets are a little bit more, you know, the alleyways are a little bit more narrow as you're going through, and the shops are a bit smaller. And it, it gives you that, I don't know if it's that more intimate feel, if, it, if it's more realistic to what, to what you would expect there. You know, it definitely feels, you know, being from Asheville, we have the same kind of shops every, you know, every, you know, little bit. It felt very much like home to me. It felt very much like, oh yeah, you got on this alleyway, you make it right in here, and there's this little great shop of of whatever piece you tend to be looking at that moment. Um, I I think it is one of those great pieces of recreation to kind of make it that that kind of tight in, very compact, very personal story, even when you're shopping. But you know the 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 influence of New Orleans on Walt in Disneyland actually you know, bleeds beyond the confines of the, the square itself, right? So when we start talking and thinking about the music in the parks, it, it starts to make me think about the parades. And even the parades 
themselves were heavily influenced by what Walt and and some of the other Imagineers who visited New Orleans saw, especially during Mardi Gras. And there was actually a gentleman who was sort of, you know, known as Mr. Mardi Gras that Walt really t- tried to bring into the Disney fold. And his name was Blaine Kern. And when I went to New Orleans last week, I heard this name talked about over and over again. Well, do you know the story of Blaine Kern? And I hadn't. And I didn't know just how much Blaine Kern had been in terms of, of the his importance in terms of Mardi Gras and how in the late 50s he met Walt when who was visiting Mardi Gras searching for for new ideas and he was so impressed you know Walt was so impressed by what the work that Kern had done including like this giant 18 foot tall gorilla that had like five people inside and it walked and it moved and here he is again sort of starting to just expand beyond the bounds of what he can present in terms of storytelling in two dimensions to three dimensions, right? He's got the bird. Audio animatronics is is just starting to be created. So Walt sees what he's doing. He's able to bring these things to life on these moving floats. And what does Walt do is he offers Kern a job to work as an Imagineer to design floats for Disneyland and, and other projects as well. Believe it or not, he said no. Yeah, you know, and, and Walt was so taken. I mean, there's a a point where Kern's gorilla float piece ends up on one of the one of the uh, Disneyland's po- programs called Carnival Time, where Ludwig von Drake sends Donald Duck to report on Mardi Gras and on New Orleans and all these pieces. It's just another way to tie it back. But then he does. He offers Kern a job. You know, Kern's boss kind of you know tells him, you know, in New Orleans you're a big fish in a small pond. Do you really want to go to the to this big <laughs> pond where you're just going to be like everyone else? And and that logic gets into Kern's head, and he eventually says, "Yep, you're right. I don't want to leave." And so he ends up staying and not going to work for Walt in Imagineering for the floats and the animatronics and all the other projects that that Walt was truly tempting him to come and, and play with. And it makes sense, you know. You, you would think, you know, how would you ever say no to Walt Disney? But from a business perspective, you know, he did the right thing, and and they ended up, you know, doing things together. And I think even Kern's son actually yep. does some things currently for Disney and other locations as well. Um, Disneyland goes on to have a party gras parade back in the early 90s celebrating, I, I guess, 35 years of magic. And then um, did that, didn't that come to Walt Disney World after being in Disneyland for a little while? I, mm, I know some of the floats. Right. Didn't they take elements of that and use it for the 20th anniversary? They might have. And then I also know that there are actually some of the parade floats – that that took place in the Mardi Gras parade in New Orleans did come to Pleasure Island and were part of of the huge parade that they had there um, several years ago. So it was so th- these parade floats kind of I'm not sure which piece goes where, but they all but they did make their way even to Walt Disney World. That's how far this Mardi Gras parade element went. Right, because they had those – those are the really big, like very – you know, vertically very, very tall floats. Yes, um, yes. Isn't it the one where they did the um – they had Roger Rabbit, right? I think that was for the 20th anniversary where they had the Roger Rabbit pray, uh, the, the, the float, um, mm-hmm. and they were inflatable. Like they were giant, like sort of yes. inflatable balloons. Yeah. yeah, and then they get, and then I believe some of them got reused over at Epcot um, for some other celebrations. They kind of, you know, it was like, oh, we have these giant inflatable balloon characters. What are we going to do with them next? We'll just we'll put them around World Showcase. It'll, it'll blend right in. Nobody's going to notice. <laughs> uh, I mean, look, even, you know, in, and I, and I, Maybe I'm I'm giving myself a reason to go back to Disneyland and, and do another show there in terms of the, the connection. But I didn't realize the last few times I've been to Disneyland, whether it's been for D23 Expo or some of the races, one of my favorite places that I really, really enjoy eating outside the park is Ralph Brennan's Jazz Kitchen, right, in downtown Disney. I, I yep. love it. We, we've been there. I love sitting outside and, and, and you know, the, the food there is is excellent. Now that I've come from New Orleans... And I understand the the meaning and the importance and the power that the name Brennan has in New Orleans and the different factions of the families and how many I mean the anywhere you eat in New Orleans, chances are it's owned by a Brennan, right? Even if it's not you know <laughs> Brennan's itself or Mister B's or Commander's Palace or whatever else, the Brennans have a hand in. So the name Ralph Brennan's Jazz Kitchen now all of a sudden has a, a dif, a, a additional significance and important to me. Um, when I go and eat there again and again and again. <laughs> and again and again. It's, <laughs> it's actually the place, at Ralph Brennan's actually the place when my wife and I uh, went out to California for our honeymoon. Our first stop was Disneyland and we got in, it was a little after lunchtime and 
we were we we put dropped our bags and started walking and we got so hungry in downtown Disney District that that's where we stopped and so that was actually the first meal I ever had in Disneyland. So I always have a reason to go back, brother. When I take you on our on our buddy road trip <laughs> comedy, um, <laughs> which we'll have to live broadcast. I will tell you that when I went to New Orleans as a kid, and relative somewhat of as a kid, in 1984, the only things that I remembered, I, I kid you not, was passing by the Superdome. I remember it was the World's Fair, and I remember my mom and dad taking me to Brennan's for brunch, and they made a really big deal. Like, my mom was like, this place is very well known, and brunch here is a big deal, and we dressed for brunch, and there were Eggs Benedict, and I remember the lattice work and the little vignettes on the wall, and I thought they were sort of clouded memories, and one of the first places that I went on my first day was back to Brennan's, and I, I took my kids there, and we went there and had some... Um, dessert and coffee and tableside bananas foster and the only thing my son wanted to do before he left New Orleans and was the last thing we did before we went to the airport is we went back to Brennan's for lunch and I'm like taking pictures and sending it to my mom and just like I know she's crying on the other end and we had we had a three hour (laughs) brunch at Brennan's which I promise you man is like one of the most spectacular meals you will ever have um I'm excited and yet weeping at the same time it was so good um anyway let's let's move on because the um I told you I'd get sidetracked by food very very quickly um we made it longer than we both thought let's just be honest about that. We did fine. Gosh, a live review of Brennan's would just be ridiculous. Really, uh, we just we really missed our boat. We should have done you know we should have gone to Disneyland last year and done sixty hours. Oh, you know, vey, come on, man! Not at one, no, 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 not at one time. No, no, yeah, no, no. thank you. <laughs> not at one, like over the course of a week, have done sixty hours of ta- of of stuff in Disneyland. We, I we sense a our- coast to coast food tour coming very very soon. Ooh. So, um, but anyway, it, look, the New Orleans Square is not the extent of the theme park connection, right? There obviously is no New Orleans Square in Disney, in Disney Walt Disney World, but what you may not realize is that as Walt was looking to not copy and paste Disneyland somewhere else, not that copy and paste was a term back in the 50s, but when he was looking for a site for what would eventually become Walt Disney World, he actually looked and scouted New Orleans pretty extensively back in... Um, the, the 60s, the, the plans for what's now an area known as uh, Bayou Sauvage, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that, um, that was one of the first choices Walt had for where Disneyland was going to be. And, you know, as as a story goes and, and legend has it, um, you know, money and politics and, and different things uh, come into play and, and Walt eventually moves on to Florida. Yeah, it, it was one of those great, I mean, he was looking for something you know, like he could be there year round where the weather wasn't going to be that much of a factor. Well, winter weather wasn't going to be that much of a factor. So he's looking east of the Mississippi, he, you know, and it, it was, it was one of those several spots that, that was there with St. Louis, DC, some spots outside of New York city and Niagara Falls. He eventually starts looking in Florida. There's three spots he's looking for. Um, but he, but New Orleans was right in the running for quite a while. Yeah, I mean, supposedly they were looking at different parcels of land on the North Shore mm-hmm. of New Orleans. You know, the way the Mississippi, uh, you know, twists and turns. There's East Bank, West Bank, North Shore, and South Shore, as I've come to learn. But in the area where the North Shore was, you know, that's sort of where they were starting to look. And unfortunately, the, the Louisiana politicians, as, as opposed to trying to lure Disney in, supposedly had a lot of demands on Walt right. and the company as opposed to Orlando, this sleepy little swampy town that's, you know, sort of opened up and gave Walt the keys to the kingdom. Um, obviously, it panned out much better. You know, while New Orleans, you know, still is a, a heavily tourist trade town, I mean, it gets probably about a quarter of the 40 million plus visitors that Orlando does. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it, it was one of those things where they were, you know, he had some developers in Florida who were like, we have, you know, 12, you know, 12.5 thousand acres for you to start with. We, 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 you know, nobody, you know, we can do this secretly. Nobody's going to have to know what you're doing. In fact, they were so secretive they didn't actually land in Orlando to refuel before they flew back to California. They would fly on to New Orleans, land there to refuel, and that would be where Walt Disney would find out that JFK had been assassinated. But it was all in that keeping the secret of, no, we're going to Florida, and we need to make sure that nobody knows what we're doing. 
Of course, no good idea uh, ever dies, and no love of New Orleans ever seems to go away, because back in the early 80s, and, and I know when we talked, um, we did a show, gosh, um, about the Empress Lily, I'm trying to remember what episode it was, it was a, it was many, many moons ago, we did a DSI, I'm trying to look quickly, I believe it was show number 123, we did a DSI of Empress Lily, I'll link to it in the show notes, there were actually plans to expand what is now Disney Springs, originally downtown Disney. At that point, it was the shopping village at Lake Buena Vista. Dick Nunes really wanted to make that, you know, remember at one point this was going to be a, a possible residential community, but it, it, the plans were always to make it what it's now eventually becoming, which is a shopping, dining, and entertainment destination for the entire family. And they wanted to create a new resort themed very very heavily themed to really resemble new orleans but at a moderate price and the reason why the empress lily is where it is and is themed the way it is is because that according to story would have been the steamboat that had docked to sort of unload the cargo on this riverfront town of new orleans and the nearby buildings that would have looked like uh, a cotton mill or other shops uh, other, you know, sort of warehouses would have had guest rooms upstairs and shopping and dining downstairs. Yeah, and it, and it, it was so it, that was such public knowledge that you know in the early '80s, by '82, it's even in you know the Casimir only publication, Eyes and Ears, where he's doing an interview when he's talking about it. How right this is going to be the port; it's the entrance to this New Orleans street. We are the guests are going to be on the second, you know, second, third, fourth, however far, far up it was going to go, and they had this all kind of. You know, planned out like, that this is how they were going to do it, and we would eventually get that kind of a concept with Boardwalk. You know, years later, which goes back to the no good idea ever truly dies, but it just it never came to fruition in that era. Yeah, I mean, I know. Look, obviously, we end up getting that when uh, Dixie Landings ends up becoming, you know, the merging sort of to be the two resorts that are Port Orleans French Quarter and Port Orleans Riverside. I could say we can do an entire show on that, but I've actually done that before. If you go back to show number 97, we did a very detailed uh, DSI, Disney Scene Investigation, of both Port Orleans, French Quarter, and Riverside. But again, now, man, as I look back in terms of having just come from New Orleans and not looking at it with a 16-year-old's eye as I did in 1984, but a 47-year-old's eye and, and really appreciate it, the theming of the French Quarter and that sort of mid 1800s and the nearby Sasagula, which we know means Mississippi in Native American. Right. I, I really get a sense of just how authentic it is. And as I was wandering through the quarter last week, I was thinking back to and look, I've talked about how I, I love the size of French Quarter. Right. It's the smallest resort. It's very intimate and the small streets and the, the shade trees and the wrought iron. Like, man, it feels like you are standing in the middle of the quarter. Yeah, it absolutely does. And it is, it, you know, everything's tight, everything's compact. There's not a ton of floors in all the buildings. Nothing is, nothing is the same. You know, whether or not the building structures are shaped the same, the, the way the wrought iron is different, the way the color palettes are different, the, the floor heights are different, the, what, what goes into a square is different. It, it's all to, you know, create these individual vignettes, these individual stories that tie you back to New Orleans. And then as you move over towards Port Orleans, you know, you get, you start, everything starts spreading out. You're getting more out, you know, more out into the, the more rural areas of, of New Orleans and of Louisiana. And so you got the bigger man, you know, the mansions and the plantations and they're a bit spread out. And then you have the, you know, the houses of the people who just, who they built what they could with their bare hands, and you know these are much smaller buildings and much clustered together because that's where your community was. It's 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 all there if you just take the time to really look and walk and see all of it. And if you go to um, if you go to to a French Quarter, mm -hmm. and you look in, um, they only have a quick service dining location as opposed to Riverside, which has you know Boatwright's Dining Hall, which is a great place to get jambalaya and the River Roost Lounge. Uh, and the beignets in the morning. Anyway, but if you, um, uh, but if you go to French Quarter, which I, again I like, they have the horse-drawn carriage rides, yeah. right? One that I just took last week, and I and I love. They've got the Scat Cat Club where you can sort of sip on a hurricane, and they've got that small one-man jazz band. But in terms of, of the dining locations, they have a 
quick service uh, location, which is the Sasagula Float Works uh, mm-hmm. and the Food Factory. If you look in there and obviously look up and around, you'll see there are a ton of Mardi Gras props and jesters and heads. Those are actually sourced, yep. right? Everything comes full circle. Those are actually sourced by the folks over at Blaine Current Artists. Yeah, it, it, these, are, these are real pieces. These are, you know, it, it's a float works. This is what these, you know, there are places in New Orleans that are float works that build these massive floats, and they have to have these giant warehouses to, to house them in. They, and they look very similar to what you're walking and eating in. And the food that is there, again, it's a, it's a Disney-fied version of it, but you feel like you are in New Orleans because there's po'boys and, and, you know, gumbo and jambalaya and fried chicken yep. and waffles. I mean, it's the food that is clearly authentic to, and I, and I know from experience because I <laughs> ate my way around the city. So, um, again, it's really sort of made me understand and appreciate um, the, the, the context and the authenticity of the resorts. And like you said, Riverside, much more of those sort of antebellum type mansions that you'd find uh, along the Mississippi. And, you know, we'll tie it into something else we're going to talk into. Back in, gosh, I think it was 2012, they just created the Royal Rooms, right? Tying it into yes. things like Princess and the Frog. Yeah, they did. They created, so you have, so now you have this little bit more of an uh, of a of a room that's going to tie into princesses, and you're going to get you know you're going to get all all the kids in who want to see the the cool things that happen in the room, the decorations around the different resorts. Um, but yeah, then we're, you know now we're back to animation with Princess and the Frog now have coming out and and playing back into the New Orleans theme. And you know we keep talking about now just think about this we we keep talking about how it ties back into you know all these things Disney. I mean it ties back into all these things that that you and I have done or you and other guests have done of you know, yes, it's, it's in this resort, or it's at this park, or it's this paddle wheel, or it's this, it's there everywhere, you know, because it's all been tied together by Walt and all these things over so many years. And and I, you know, I, I've talked about it in the past, and I, I probably um, feel this way even more so now, you know, in terms of moderate resorts, Port Orleans has always been my favorite, and I would sort of waffle in between, oh, I see, Oh. <laughs> unintentional pun I would waffle in between Riverside and French Quarter picking one over the other sometimes for different reasons I think Riverside has the sit down restaurants it's a little bit larger although I love the the, the small intimacy I love that the, the, it's a little bit quieter but I think that there is something incredibly romantic uh, about French Quarter. The fact that it's small, the fact that the buildings are only two stories and yeah. um, the wrought iron and the cobblestone. I mean, I think it, you might not think of that as a romantic type resort, but if this is sort of your style and you want to take that carriage ride or, or walk mm-hmm. along or take a boat run along the Sasagula, I think Fort, Port, uh, Port Orleans French Quarter fits very, very nicely. But I think you're absolutely right. If you want to go sit and and just and, and truly just sit by a fountain and listen to the water and and watch the you know the flowers and the trees and and have that romantic moment. Take that carriage ride, uh, you know. It has the cobblestone streets that are your walkways. It has you know the, the manhole covers that have New Orleans imprinted on them. I think it does have that romance. in, in when you look at French Quarter, and I tend to go towards Riverside when I'm feeling a little bit nostalgic. I don't want to stay at Fort Wilderness Campgrounds, but it's kind of like the moderate <laughs> level of that is Riverside. Um, in the alligator bayou section but i yeah there's a romance to to french quarter that uh that definitely definitely you know generates a spirit for for you and whomever you're with like the real french quarter um you know things like the 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 gas lamps i mean i know it's so silly mm. but as we were walking through the the real french quarter i was i was noting how many of the restaurants and the shops still have, even some of the, the homes on, on like St. Charles Street still have the gas lamps. And I think there's something beautiful and romantic about keeping, again, pun intended, that that sort of flame alive. So um, we, we mentioned in passing Princess and the Frog. I think it bears certainly mentioning it because it does take place in 1920s New Orleans. And, you know, the three plus years of work that went into this was really important for a lot of reasons. I mean, this was kind of what was going to mark the, the the studio's first return to that traditional hand-drawn 2D animation. Um, it was notable. It was also the first Disney African-American princess. Mm-hmm. And again, the idea of the real-life setting of 
New Orleans as opposed to, you know, someplace that was, you know, make believe like the Enchanted Forest or Arendelle, which we know is is in Norway. But, you know, instead of a fairy tale land, it was taking place in a real location. And that's why the attention to detail and the authenticity, the, the you know, John D- Lasseter said, you know, get the details right. Like, yeah. you need to go there. And he loved, you know, he was a fan of New Orleans. He came up with the idea of setting the film there. He made sure, you know, Ron Clements and John Musker and the other animation team spent a lot of time in New Orleans and coming back over and over again to make sure they, you know, took pictures and recorded the sounds and, and sketch, you know, over and over again. Yeah, it truly, it truly was a, a, a labor of love and to make sure that you got that right. And especially, like you said, when we are going back to hand-drawn animation and we are going to have our first African-American princess and, you know, we're going to have – it's going to be such a strong story. It's going to have such – you know, the music has to be right. The, the, the de- de- like you said, the details down to the roads, down to what do the trees look like, down to what – you know, the houses – they had to have it all. They had to have it all perfect, or else it wasn't going to work. And and they they truly did hit it out of the park. And you know what's funny, man? Having just come back, usually when I travel, I find myself taking pictures. Probably number one, mostly of food first, um, <laughs> as opposed to the locale. But I took hundreds of photos yeah. of New Orleans. And actually, if you go to my Facebook profile, facebook dot com slash Lou Mangello, I, I put up an album there because. The, the the scenery, the architecture, the, the the stories that are told from the weathered doors and the streets mm-hmm. and every is just fascinating, and the the crew of um, Princess and the Frog, whether they were producers or directors or animators or background artists, did so many of the things that I you know that I ended up doing right. They, I mean, I didn't get to ride in a Mardi Gras float parade, but but they did. They went on the steamboat Natchez, which is what we did on our, our on the road event, right? So they can sort of yeah. get the idea of what it was like to actually be on a river, you know, a river going vessel on the Mississippi. They went to the jazz festivals, right? They wanted to get a feel for the music. They rode on a St. Charles Avenue streetcar, which made its way into the film. It was something that I did on my last night there. I wanted to ride in that that turn of the century streetcar and see the homes on St. Charles. Because, you know, and and even Lasser said, you need to get these streetcars right. You know, he loves railroads. He wants it to look right and to feel right and, and to even sound right. Because anytime you put something in the real world, you're going to get that critique. You're going to get the people who live there, who know that world, who are going to say, no, you didn't do that right. You didn't do us justice. You didn't do this correctly. And and so they had to get it correctly. And and they did. They you know they got down to nuts and bolts that that had maybe been rusted because of you know all the pieces. They just they got it. They got it right. And look, even the the tiniest details, right? The names of the yeah. newspapers being read by the characters, the Tom Picayune, yep. the the buildings, the the music, which I love, man. I, I there's I have a, a for reasons I, I won't share. I have a um, a very deep emotional connection to the music because of the timing of when this this film came out. And Randy Newman wrote the music, right? He spent yeah. a lot of his childhood growing up there, but the music that was performed reflected so many of the different styles, right? There's there's Zydeco and gospel and and, mm-hmm. and jazz. Um, they consulted with people who are from New Orleans, whether they were restaurateurs or storytellers, you know, um, women like Leah, Leah Chase and Colleen Sally, who were actually given credit in the film's uh, closing credits, you know, giving gratitude to these women whose, you know, strength and, and wit and character embody the spirit of New Orleans, you know, sort of taking that and applying it to Princess Tiana. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why. I, I think Princess and the Frog is very much an overlooked film. I think it's a beautifully drawn film. And, and uh, I really fell in love with the, the music from there. And now, having been to New Orleans, I have a completely new appreciation for it. Definitely, I think I, I think as a film it does. It's it's oh right, that's that movie that went back to the hand drawn animation, and that kind of was where a lot of people's knowledge of it w- will tend to end. And there is so much more to it to, that if if you're just willing to explore it on a deeper level, deeper level level, <laughs> I'm getting tongue tied. <laughs> uh, it's just it, it it there's there's so much to enjoy and there's so much to appreciate if if you'll take that time. And while in Walt Disney World, you can still, and I guess in Disneyland, you can still meet Princess Tiana. I will tell you, man, one of the things that I loved, and I was willing to um, 
you know, I was willing to sort of forgive and forget story and and timing and all that because back in 2009, they had a show in Frontierland slash Liberty Square, I believe also in Disneyland as well, called yeah. Tiana's Showboat Jubilee. And... Tiana and Prince Naveen and Dr. Facilier and Louis the Alligator and this ba- jazz band came out from the area in between uh, the Diamond Horseshoe and the entrance to Frontierland in a small mini parade, made their way onto the Liberty Bell River Road, which was decked out in, in the, the purple, red, and green bunting. Uh, um, they would bring on guests to come on. They would wave, yep. and they would put on a show, which was such... The music was so high energy. Did it fit in the theme and story of, of Liberty Square in New Orleans? Ab, uh, Liberty Square in Frontierland? Absolutely, Absolutely not. not. I, I was able to suspend my disbelief because I loved that show so much. I mean, it only ran, I don't know, a, a couple of months. Um, yeah. But it was one that I really, really liked. It was. And it would make us, and it would, it, you would hear it playing, and it would stop right along that walkway if you take the cut up between Splash Mountain and Thunder Mountain and it would stop right there and it would project the music out and, and it was just you couldn't help but dance and I can remember seeing you know kids of all of all ages quite literally because I probably was doing it too but they were dancing on that sidewalk and it was and it would be jam packed full of people you couldn't get by because it was just infectious and everyone wanted to to hear it and see it take part in it and it was it was and I think you know, having that parade that led to the boat rather than just starting it on the boat Gave you know it was another piece of of that real world. This is you know this is what happens in New Orleans. Feel to it that was just incredible. And it gave it breathed energy and, and life into yeah. the steamboat in a very different way than just riding on a sort of leisurely you know tour of of the rivers of America. Which is part of the reason why I loved it too. It made that sort of the centerpiece of the parade. It got people to to pay attention to focus on it um, and appreciate. You know, not just the the history of the steamboat, but the connection that it had to New Orleans. Um, and look, Disney even, you know, look, Disney obviously is a, is a brilliant marketing machine in terms of of synergy. But one thing that they did, too, was they worked with New Orleans tourism when the film came out. And, you know, you oftentimes you can win a trip to Disney World or Disneyland and you can do all these different things. They had a, uh, and I don't know if you remember this, they had a, a program called followhermagic.com. And if you won the contest, you actually didn't get to go to Disney World, but you went to New Orleans and you went to all the real life places they referenced in the film. And and I just thought that was smart and a great way to sort of make people really see that the places that are in the film did not necessarily come out of an artist's or an imagineer's mind. But those are places that um, are rich in history and real story. And it it was one of those things I kept waiting for. That to continue on after the contest for the Adventures by Disney, which is going to be the exact same tour that you could now go on on your own, whether or not you won the contest. Because it, it, it does have that p- place where, especially you know, when the movie came out, there were people for a long time that it carried with them. And that I think even today they would go and they would see these places and it would, they would have a new appreciation for the film and for, and for where it came from. And I, uh, I will tell you that I'm, I'm hoping to do the same. You know, uh, this show is not going to be the end of my discussion about Disney and New Orleans. Um, I'm going to put out some other content that I'm planning and I'm very excited about going to do the research for. Um, and I will tell you that um, I, I will do a review about the food and I might have to go back to do New Orleans to uh, do a little bit more diligence. Research. Of you course. Be, All in the name of research. Be, yeah. Uh, and you I can to, tell you, you have to do it right. I, I, listen, and speaking of doing it right, you know the the on the road the event that we did last last week um, was a lot of fun. We, we really, really had a good time from beginning to end. And I can tell you, we will be back again doing it next year. Um, we tied it into the New Orleans Rock and Roll Half Marathon this year. We're going to go back. We're going to tie it into that weekend again. That's going to be the weekend of February 5th. So you can circle your calendar um, and save the date now, and I'll have details as we get closer. But I think uh, that's some of what I want to do, too, is not just – you know, bring a little bit of French Quarter and Riverside at, and, you know, some of the attention to places in New Orleans, but maybe some stuff from Princess and the Frog. And yes, it will involve lots of food. But look, clearly, you know, today, uh, going back, you know, 50, 60 years, really, the New Orleans experience can still be felt and tasted throughout Disneyland and, and Walt Disney World. So I want to ask you, the listener, 
Have you ever been to New Orleans? And, and what do you think? How does Disney compare? Or what is your favorite New Orleans detail or reference and or food item that you can find in Walt Disney World or Disneyland? I would love for you to go at Facebook.com slash Lou Mangiello. You can post it there. Tweet me at Lou Mangiello or come by and comment in the show notes over at www.radio.com. Click on the podcast link and this week's episode, you can leave a comment right there. Uh, Also, be sure I'll link to show number 97, the DSI on Port Orleans, and then show number 123 where we talk about uh, the Empress Lily and the resort that never was. I will also link to Ryan Wilson's MainStreetGazette.com. That's MainStGazette.com. And you are at MainStreetGazette on all the social, correct? All the pieces. Yeah, and uh, on the you put lots of great stuff on Instagram and Facebook yeah. and Twitter. And uh, of course, my friend, we will uh, listen. I, I, I'm not. I'm serious. I, the buddy movie to New Orleans. We could make that happen. They are building. Uh, they are going to re. Um, they're going to restart the train going from Orlando to New Orleans. So yes. maybe we start so we- off in Port Orleans French Quarter and then make our way to New Orleans French Quarter. And then we got a plane from there to California, and it just and we just keep going. Look, and as long as we're halfway there, we might as well go to Japan. So you know, since, <laughs> since it would it would be remiss of us. It if would we be did a it crime. It would be a crime if we did. Right. So right. Uh, yeah, man. Thank you very much for uh, joining me tonight. Uh, as always, I, I love chatting with you. I'm starving at the end of these episodes, and uh, and I'll tell you, I am genuinely looking forward to going back and seeing Port Orleans. In comparing it to the real New Orleans, so uh, so thank you, buddy. No problem. I, lo- I love being here anytime. Dreams do come true. Time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week. I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World history or see how well you pay attention to the details, not just in what you see, but sometimes in what you hear. If you think you know the answer, you can enter via email for your chance to win a Disney prize package. Before we get to this week's question, let's go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So on the last show, I was doing a live restaurant review of the Tangerine Cafe in Morocco and Epcot Center. And so, of course, I had to tie the trivia question to the topic of the week. And your question was simply to tell me, what was the name of the area in Morocco, in Epcot, which represents a typical Moroccan home? So if you walk into the Moroccan pavilion and go off to the left-hand side, to the right of the gallery is something known as the Fez House, and that's what represents a typical home in Morocco. You can see beautiful tiles and mosaics and carvings and things that represent daily life in that area of the world. And if you listen very, very carefully as you approach the fountain, you might even hear people talking and children playing in the distance. So I took all the correct entries, and again, thanks to everybody who entered and got this one correct, knew that it was the Fez house. I took all the correct entries, randomly selected one, and again, you were playing last week for the 102 Ways to Save Money for and at Walt Disney World book, all seven of my virtual audio tours of the park, which you can find over at www.radio.com, a WW Radio Magic Band cover, and a cruise backpack and mug from our cruise on the Disney Fantasy just a few weeks ago. And last week's winner, randomly selected, is... Christy Nazal. So, Christy, congratulations. Send me your address and I will get your package out to you right away. If you played last week and didn't win, that's okay. Forget about it. Move on because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So, I am missing New Orleans. I'm loving New Orleans. We're going to stay in New Orleans. And surprisingly, the question is not about food. The question is simply this. Tell me, what famous location in New Orleans is the Port Orleans French Quarter gift shop named after. Again, what famous location in the real New Orleans is the Port Orleans French Quarter gift shop named after? Now this time I'm going to give you two weeks because I'm traveling next week to the Philippines. Probably won't go to show out in time. So you have until Sunday, March 20th at 11.59 p.m. to answer via email to contest at www.radio.com. And this week you're going to get the 102 Ways to Save Money book all the audio tours, a WW Radio Magic Band cover, and special Mardi Gras beads direct from New Orleans. So good luck and have fun, y'all. 
Sounds so much better when people from New Orleans say it. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in. I sincerely appreciate you and the fact that you take time to tune in and listen each and every week. Huge thanks to everybody that came out to New Orleans last week for our events on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It was so wonderful to meet you. You and your town are so incredibly beautiful and welcoming, and I cannot wait to come back to New Orleans. Big thanks, as always, to Becky Mankin and Mouse Fan Travel for sponsoring our On the Road event in New Orleans. Listen, you don't have to be going to a Disney destination. She and her team can help you go anywhere on the planet. Please go and visit them over at mousefantravel.com and follow them at Mouse Fan Travel on all the social. Don't forget that if you want to help the show and be part of the WW Radio Nation community, visit www.radio.com slash support. It's a great way to help the show and get exclusive rewards every month, including scavenger hunts, access to our private group, video chat, backpacks, t-shirts, care packages every month from Walt Disney World and more. I want to thank some recent new members of the WW Radio family, including John J. Smith, Nick Slate and Paul over at powwows.com. I sincerely appreciate each and every one of you. Don't forget that in addition to the show, you can find the blog and videos and newsletter and so much more over at www.radio.com. And please follow me at facebook.com slash Lou Mangiello. Join me for a live video broadcast and chat every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Turn on notifications as I go live, as I travel not just to the Disney parks, but including next week, literally to the opposite side of the planet. You can also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest at Lou Mangiello for upcoming meets of the month and events in person because nothing beats a handshake and a hug. Please visit the events page over at www.radio.com. And as always, my friends, and you are my friends, whether we have met yet or not, all I ask is that if you like the show, please help spread the word. Tell your friends, tweet out a link to this week's show. Better yet, share it over on Facebook and come by and comment on the show at facebook.com slash Lou Mangiello. Share videos from my recent live broadcast from the Flower and Garden Festival. And please go to iTunes, take a minute, rate and review the show there. Thanks to you. We hit number two overall among iTunes podcasts and have more than a thousand five-star reviews. Would love to keep them coming. I want to thank recent reviewers, including Ashley Hauk, Isla Damanafa, I don't know how to pronounce <laughs> what that is, Mrs. Muma, Jess TV, and Squeeblenaut. I just like saying Squeeblenaut. Again, you can visit www.radio.com slash iTunes for a direct link and instructions on how to rate and review the show. And finally, my sincerest thanks to you for listening, for emailing, tweeting, coming to Meets of the Month, for telling your friends, and for allowing me to do what I love and share my passion for Disney with you through the show and so many other ways. I am eternally and uh, immeasurably grateful and I want you to do what you love each and every day so take the next step you know the direction you need to go to get where you want to be take a step however small have faith and always keep moving forward thank you thank you thank you I hope you have an amazing week hope to see you on one of the live broadcasts soon so until next time see ya Good morning, Lou Mangiello. It's Gabby from Baltimore. Uh, just calling in to say hello after finally settling back in after the absolutely magical time I had this past weekend at uh, Princess Marathon Weekend. It was not only my first run Disney race, but also my first half marathon. Um, even though I wasn't able to attend the meet of the month or even catch up with you and the WDW radio running team before the race, Seeing you and some of the team right at the entrance into Epcot was such a boost to get me through that last bit of the race. Um, I just embarrass- I embarrassingly remember rounding the corner, seeing you in a sea of blue shirts, and just screaming, WDW, Lou Mangiello, <laughs> and nearly mowing you down to nab a sweaty hug and a quick selfie before speeding to the finish line. From the expo to the on-course characters to the absolutely wonderful volunteers to the tremendous support and camaraderie amongst not only the runners but the spectators as well, it just made for the most magical and supportive environment for me, especially as a first-time runner. Um, so for anyone listening to this thinking, oh, I could never do that, 
Think again because, yes, you can. Uh, like Walt Disney said, if you can dream it, you can do it. Um, needless to say, I am itching to register for my next run Disney race, which for me will be the Wine and Dine Half Marathon. I've already settled on it. Um, it'll be my first time at the Food and Wine Festival, and me and my tummy cannot wait. Um, so everyone have a great rest of your week. I hope to see you again soon, um, and hopefully I'll be able to really catch up and chat with you at the Wine and Dine at the Food and Wine Festival. Alrighty. Talk to you later. Bye. Hello. Nick from Milwaukee. Just finished listening to your, uh, Pantry and Cafe review. But thanks to Paula, no matter what, the time of my vacation, every time I go down there, it's Pantry and Cafe. Combo platter, formal platter, sit outside, watch somebody walk by. I'll, uh, I'll even ruin a dinner for it. It's, uh, it's fantastic every single time. So, appreciate the review. Keep it up with the great shows. Hey Lou, this is Rob from California, Maryland. It's just a few days after uh, the Glass Slipper Challenge and the uh, Enchanted 10K Marathon. I'm actually calling you from Epcot right now. I uh, just wanted to call and say hello, uh, let you know that it was a pleasure to kind of sort of meet you as I gave you one of the grossest, sweatiest hugs I've ever seen uh, during the half marathon. The uh, Dream Team Project will be getting a, uh, a nice uh, donation for that privilege. So. Just want to say hi to you one last time, and to the rest of the WW Radio running team. I'll probably see you guys next time we'll do a run Disney event. It was great, and we'll talk to you guys there. Thanks, go on. Bye. I got Hulu, I got Hulu, I got things I ain't even tried. And I got friends on the other side. He's got friends on the other side.